Hands up if you have a brother or sister. Two hands up if you have more than one. Okay, next question. This is going to require a thumbs up and not so sure a thumbs down. How well do you get on? Oh, lots of very positive ones. And then some people not showing any hands at all, which I'm a bit suspicious of. It's an amazing thing to have a sibling, a brother or sister. There is probably no one in the world who knows you in the way that they do. And it's the potential to be a really amazing relationship. Uh, they kind of, they shape you. You know, you, you, you growing up with someone, you're, you're defined in re- reaction and relationship to a sibling. But of course, you will also know they can be really difficult relationships. And when they go wrong, they can be exceptionally painful and very difficult to fix. They can bring out the best in you. They can bring out the worst in you. Hopefully not as bad as this story this evening. But if you can overcome that, there is perhaps no greater blessing than a brother or a sister who will know you your whole life long. So we come to Genesis chapter 4 and the story of Cain and Abel. It's an epic, ancient story, which is hugely important. It's the story of two brothers. It's a story of grief and broken families and the choices that lead to that. If you were with us last week, you'll know we were thinking about Genesis 3 and the question of where did it all go wrong. This is kind of the implications of that This is what it looks like when it starts to go terribly wrong. You might also know that this story of Cain and Abel inspired one of the great novels of the 20th century. John Steinbeck's East of Eden is an epic. It's an astonishing book. And um, it is in many ways not just a sort of retelling, but a reflection on the implications of this story of Cain and Abel. And I think for Steinbeck, these stories are there not just to help make sense of who we are, but to force us to face up to some of the worst aspects of our humanity and what we are possible, what we are capable of, so that we might avoid them. Let me remind you of the context of this. Adam and Eve are exiles. They are literally east of Eden. They have left the garden. And their relationship with one another is more difficult. Their relationship with creation is kind of disconnected and their relationship with God is more distant. But there is still joy and wonder to be found. And Eve has that miraculous, astonishing experience of giving birth to a child. She brings forth a son. And she says, with the help of the Lord, I brought forth a man. And the name Cain literally means to bring forth. A son is born, must have been deeply loved and treasured. And then a second son is born. But his name, there's no explanation of it. And yet it is, in its very essence, uh, a reference to the fleetingness of his life. Because his name foreshadows the grief that is to come. Abel means a breath. And his life is simply a breath. So these two brothers grow up and they find their places in the world. One is a keeper of sheep. The other farms the earth. And when harvest time comes and when they, they have that amazing experience of, you know, um, uh, of the earth bringing forth its increase and celebrating harvest, each of them wants to bring an offering to God in recognition that all things come from God and we should give something back as an expression of gratitude. So in verse 3, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil and Abel also brought some of the firstborn of his flock. However, those offerings are not the same, and the boys know it. Verse 4, the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not look with favor. Now, I don't know what that looked like in practice, but if you have ever given a gift that sort of missed the mark, you might know how it feels. You know when you give a Christmas present and it's just not right, 
and then someone else gives one and it's clearly so much thought has gone into it and it's from the heart and the person is really moved by that experience and there's something of that here. One is an offering which is given of the best and one is an afterthought. One is a a sacrifice. Abel gave some of the first fruits of his flock. It's It's a meaningful, valuable offering. The other is a token. Cain gives some of the fruits of the soil. And there's no doubt that one offering was better and more meaningful than the other. And we should, of course, give of our best in thanks to God. We should. We should give you know, the first fruits of what we receive and give it back to God in gratitude. But the problem here is not the offering. The problem is the response. Verse 5, Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. His pride rears up And as a result, he experiences shame. Someone once said pride is not the opposite of shame, but its source. Shame is this incredibly powerful force. And you might know something of this. You know, when you do something and it's not right, and that shame sort of spirals out of control. Do you see Cain turns his face away? His anger rears up at God and against his brother. And rather than do what would be the natural thing to do in this circumstance, which would be to say, listen, I'm sorry, I I didn't get that right. I should have put more thought into that. I'll do better next time. You know, that's the right response. But his response is fury. Do you see it's his pride and his shame which drive him. And as a result, he turns away from God. And I think that matters in itself. Just note that. Because often when we feel like we're far from God, it's not God who's turned away, but us. When we do something wrong and we allow our shame to drive us, we turn away from God and suddenly we think God feels so distant. God hasn't gone anywhere. We, like Cain, turn our face away. And there is in this, this kind of foundational and hugely important understanding of what is meant by sin in the Bible. Because it is not primarily the act. It's not making a mistake. It is an inclination of the heart. We all err, but what you do next is the most important thing. And did you see those words? Really significant. Verse 7. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door and it desires to have you and you must rule over it. Cain's sin is not that he made an offering which was not all that it should have been, but was his anger, his fury. And anger is powerful and it drives us and there's something addictive about it. If we don't deal with it, it will spiral. Often one of the things that we do is we kind of internalize it and it becomes bitter. And so much of our world is marked by anger that's got out of control, by ancient grudges and arguments and the violence that comes as a result of it. Do you see that this ancient story speaks to the heart of the human problem and the violence of our world? What does it mean to do what is right? Well, resist the temptation to think that it's all about morality. It's all about doing the right thing in all circumstances and sort of standing proudly, never having made a mistake. No. To do what is right is that when you make your mistake, you face up to it. You turn back towards your brother or towards God. You face up to it. You genuinely apologize. You're eager to make up for it. You learn from it. Instead of fury, blaming someone else, allowing your shame to alienate you from people. And this is Cain's choice. What will he do with this experience of shame and anger? Verse 8, Cain said to his brother, 
let us go out into the field. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother and killed him. And so murder comes into the world. And it is a consequence of Cain's anger and his inability to do what is right and to lift his face. And sin literally was crouching at the door and he is mastered by it. And in the story of Cain and Abel, we see the origin of so much of the violence and bloodshed in our world. And its origin is pride and shame and anger and the inability to master those things. Sin is crouching at the door. It desires to have you. Abel is killed. His life is extinguished like a breath of wind. And his voice is silence. Cain is then challenged by the Lord. And did you see he uttered the immortal words? Verse 9, the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? And in doing so, that statement of having no regard for the life of your brother or your sister, whether that's your literal brother or sister or brother and sister in the human family, in that dishonest, disdainful, dismissive, self-centered and arrogant response, he betrays his heart. Am I my brother's keeper? Because the interesting thing is, of course, the answer to that is, yes, of course, you are your brother's keeper. But more than that, in actual fact, the phrase keeper sounds like somebody who looks after animals, like a, a shepherd. And you're more than your brother's keeper. You are your brother's brother. You are your sister's sister. And that the relationships that we are created for are what matters more than anything else. For Cain, all that mattered was himself. Do you see? His wounded pride, his experience of shame, his anger, his desire to vindicate himself and to get vengeance. It was all about him. What we are created for is relationships. And relationships can be difficult and disappointing. And we will make mistakes. But the ability to turn our faces back to people, to humble ourselves, to reconcile and repair relationships is the only thing that matters in this life. So much so that God goes to the ends of the earth to reconcile himself with us through the death of Christ upon the cross. We choose relationships over everything else. And we need to humble ourselves in order to do that. We need to forgive and seek forgiveness. That is what we are made for. As a result of Cain's choice, human beings become more disconnected from the world. That somehow that gap between creation and um, humanity becomes more. Did you see that phrase? Cain becomes like a restless wanderer upon the earth. And once again, so much of our human experience is that. To be restless wanderers on the earth. Disconnected from one another and from God and from creation. This is one of the great Stories, one of the epics, one of the stories that make sense of who we are and challenge us about who we are becoming. And it says to us, we need to make that choice day by day about the kind of person that we are going to be. Because it is those choices that make us who we are. And we need to do that which is right. Not to never make a mistake, but when you do make mistakes, not turn your face away to seek reconciliation, to choose relationship, to seek forgiveness and to forgive, to humble ourselves and not allow our pride and our anger to master us. You need to make that choice and you need to make it every day. Overcome your pride and your shame, choose humility and relationships and love above all things. And of course, that failure to master sin is the tragic story of so much of human history. And it might be easy to despair that human beings can ever really choose to do what is right. But in Christ, our fallen human nature is being renewed. And the spirit of God is at work in us afresh. And we can choose good. 
We can turn away from the worst parts of our human nature because, as Philippians said, I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. So choose. Choose now the person that you are becoming. The past matters less than you think. There is a future which is opening before you, which you can choose. But it will require you to humble your hearts, to seek forgiveness and to forgive, to choose to do that which is right, to choose love and relationships and your brother and your sister and your God. Amen.